most theoretical interest. And besides, quantum mechanics and other parts of physics can at least cast at least some doubt on even the theoretical worth of this idea. Basically, we are asking if the universe operates determinist deterministically, which is an open question. You know, this it's, I think it was Laplace who said, well, look, if you were to give me the position and momentum of every particle in the universe, I could tell you the rest of the future. And this is, leads to one of kind of the grand philosophical questions which um, you know, we'll be investigating as part of this class as well, which is, you know, if the universe operates deterministically, if Newton's laws govern how my arm falls and how all the atoms in my body interact, where does free will creep into? How do I know I have control over these actions? And it's not the fact that at the Big Bang, there was a denser cluster of atoms over here um, and a less dense over here, and things evolved according to deterministic laws much like the formal systems we're playing with here. So this question you can really think of on two levels. One, can the universe be thought of as being modeled by a formal system, having forces and solving equations for if a particle's here and it collides with another particle at this angle, they go off like this, and things like this. But it also, I think, likes to ask uh, another question which is version two, for those of you who are kind of Matrix fans. Um, to what extent is the universe a formal system proper, in the sense? Is it a program, you know, running in the background of some hyperdimensional alien who's playing WoW, and, uh, you know, he's just running our universe as a simulation on his, uh, you know, supercomputer cluster that he's got in his basement? Um, who knows? I mean, if the universe is deterministic, or he can just he's just coded up, you know, hacking away in Python all of our rules of our universe, and he said, all right, let's let the simulation go, and here we are in his computer having all these kind of dramatic interactions with people, et cetera, et cetera, um, and he's just kind of interested. Up, oh, bug came up, et cetera. Um, it's it's kind of interesting to think about. So. We've now really kind of hit home these five tools for thinking. Um, and we're going to be revisiting all of these ideas throughout the entire book. And, I, and one of the things that Bach does, one of the things that Douglas Hofstadter does is he, he structures his book in its own kind of recursive fashion. And you know, I only gave you a few specific instances of where recursion shows up. And this represents kind of my, my bias. For me, I'm very much an art person and a math person, but I'm not so much of a music person. And I really encourage you guys to bring in different elements, because GEB has such like a high-dimensional structure to it. Everybody contributes their own slice to it. Um, and one thing which I would hate to deny, for, deny you guys from is, is the music aspect of this book. Each one of Douglas Hofstadter's dialogues is, is actually structured and based upon a piece of box music. And if you listen to box music, and you read the dialogue, you might actually hint at some of the connections, some of the isomorphism that Hofstadter is alluding to. Um, but uh, first of all, you should know why he chose Bach, how recursion acts in music. And that's why I have this whole speaker set up here. So allow me to play. So this is Bach's little fugue in G minor, uh, just as a nice anecdote. Uh, who here has seen a, a Beautiful Mind in the movie? All right, so John Nash, the mathematician who went crazy, Princeton, et cetera. The story goes that he used to actually stalk around the halls of the math department smoking cigarettes and whistling this song constantly. And what were some of the things which you noticed about, about this piece? For those of you with good auditory abilities, what did you notice? OK, elaborate a little bit on these patterns. Exactly. So you heard it come in at a different tone, at a different volume, um, and you notice it was the same theme. It's the same theme that he played stretched, inverted, backwards, on higher levels, on lower levels. So GEB is actually very much structured like a fugue. Hofstadter lays out for us, and what I did in this first lecture is I laid out the entire, I'm laying out the entire book for you, all in one go. 
So that way you understand it when I play it stretched out, inverted, backwards, and at different volumes. So this is nice. You have a musical illustration. You have artistic illustrations of the ideas we're talking about. But we need to actually kind of settle into um, the book itself. So Kern Kelleher and I, or anyone else who's really excited about reading, anybody really excited about volunteering for reading a dialogue? Anybody have the book with them right now? Oh, good job. Um, would you like to read? You don't have to. You want to? OK. So we're going to spend the last kind of 15 minutes going through a dialogue. I actually have another copy. Um, good. And um, so I need two characters, one to be Achilles and one to be Tortoise. These are two characters we're, we're going to meet in this dialogue. And they're going to play a prominent role throughout the entire book. So let's, does anyone else want to be? Well, see, I like the tortoise, so I'd like to be the tortoise. But someone else can be the tortoise if they want to be. OK? So we only have one soul that's brave enough to do it. <laughs> All right. All righty. So page 79. So, yeah, sorry. So I'm going to give you some, uh, some quick quick background on, on this dialogue. Um, so Hofstadter, like me, believes that it's important to introduce the idea of a, of a topic conceptually first before we start really diving into it. So he prefaces every chapter with a, with a dialogue. And the dialogue is kind of a conceptual introduction to the ideas we're talking about. To go ahead and give you an idea of what this dialogue is based on, it's uh, going to be the conflict of two mathematicians, um, Kurt Gödel and David Hilbert. Uh, David Hilbert believed that mathematics could be put into a formal system very rigorously, and it could also be proved to be consistent and complete. And those are two words which I'm going to have to define kind of at the end of this dialogue. But let's go ahead and start it off and try to work quickly through this. Um, I'm going to ask that when you have the italics, you go ahead and read it if it's part of your section so people have an idea of what's going on in the, in the book. All right, excellent. So we don't have really any time left. Um, but I want to say one thing. It's a challenge. Uh, pay attention to Tortoise's quote on page 81 uh, when she talks about acrostics. If you can find two acrostics in this dialogue, 